Um, well, all of the panelists are back on view and um, more and more people continue to join. So I think I'll go ahead and begin my part of the introduction so we can get rolling on the actual conversation soon. Uh, my name is Christina Linden. I have been with Art Practical as um, the executive director just since September this past year. And we're really glad to be together this evening, even if in this limited format that we can be together right now um, for a really amazing panel discussion. I'm gonna um, leave the logistical setup kind of introduction to Vivian who'll take over as soon as I'm done, but we've had quite a few questions about um, the current situation with Art Practical itself. And we hope to have the focus of much of tonight's conversation be on the field of art publishing as a whole. So I wanted to just begin by kind of um, giving a sense of where we stand. Um, we're really excited to be uh, rolling out new content for our current issue, 11.3 called um, On Being Included. Um, and that new content will continue rolling out over the course of the next weeks. So please um, keep looking at the Art Practical website. Uh, there's some really amazing uh, pieces I'm really honored to have had this opportunity um, this spring to put together this last issue with California College of the Arts, um, with whom our publishing relationship will conclude on June 30th, 2020. Uh, in the coming months, uh, our practical will be going into something of a hibernation. Um, we are unfortunately, very, very unfortunately, losing our incredibly talented and dedicated staff um, and they will be losing the part of their livelihood that has been coming from Art Practical. Um, today was also the last day we had the privilege of working with talented CCA student production assistants. Uh, it was their last day today. So I'd like to thank specifically uh, Catherine Hamilton and Daniel Thomas, who've been working with us in this capacity this past semester uh, for all of their efforts, including the contributions they've made to shaping this event tonight. Um, CCA will support the website remaining online, our practical website, through at least the end of 2020. Uh, and we are exploring options for keeping the site either hosted in static form on the CCA servers beyond that date or migrating it elsewhere. This fall, a repository archive of all past content published on our practical and daily serving, a decades long contribution of hundreds of artists and writers will be created um, first on CCA's vault system, which is something um, that we're doing in collaboration with the CCA libraries. Monica Weston has very generously um, volunteered to help facilitate that archiving project along with the CCA librarians. Um, but there will also be some costs associated with exporting the content from our current content management system. Um, we are also hoping to create a second archive through the Internet Archives Archive It program. Um, and we did get a quote for that this past week. Um, we do need to raise some modest funds to support those two archiving projects. Um, and to that end, I'm really excited to announce that our practical was able to renew its relationship with Intersection for the Arts as a nonprofit um, fiscal sponsor this past week. Uh, Intersection was the fiscal sponsor for our practical prior to the relationship with California College of the Arts. Um, and the reason that's important is that we are now able to accept uh, donations that we can access after June, after the end of the relationship with CCA, um, and specifically any donations that we receive from this point forward will um, go to the very crucial project of supporting those archiving costs. We're estimating that we can probably do the whole thing for about $2,000, so it's really modest. I would point out that if everyone who was um, registered for the event today was able to contribute even just $10, um, we would be able to meet that modest immediate goal. Um, but in addition to the focus this fall on archiving projects, we will continue to explore conversations about uh, potential partnerships and new structures for the organization um, immediately, we're looking at a possible funded thematic issue, one special issue this fall while we're doing the archiving work. Um, but obviously, we're also hoping to build a fund um, that will allow us to pay writers and editors for ongoing publishing down the line. Um, we're holding this door open, and we hope that uh, we'll be able to continue to do so beyond 2020. Um, but again, for the immediate moment, uh, we are looking at a kind of hibernation system and uh, making sure that that archiving is done uh, properly and thoroughly so that we don't lose this valuable content that's been produced. 
Um, if, if you have any specific questions or thoughts related to Art Practical and its future today or after the panel, um, I would encourage you to reach out to me directly. Um, you can find my contact information on the website, um, but it's pretty simple. It's just Christina at artpractical.com and I will um, add that and also the donation link for our new intersection fund into the chat in just a moment. Um, in case people have to cut out, I do also want to take this opportunity to thank a few people. Um, there's no way I can thank everybody I'd like to thank at this moment, but I, I want to thank especially uh, Vivian Sming, Adi Rabinowicz, and Larissa Malor for all of their hard work in preparing for this event and in keeping important content flowing through our editorial channels this past year. Uh, thank you also to Leila Weifer, Fiona Ball, Sam Soon, Emily Marker, and Will Betka Brunswick. It's really been a pleasure working with each of you during my um, time at Art Practical. Um, thanks also to our amazing editors, Deanna Lee, Ashley Stoll Myers, Anton Stobner, Vanessa Kaufman Zimmerly, Rose Linka, and Marissa Deitz. Thank you um, to all of the staff and editors, also who came before my time. And to each and every one of our contributors, um, to Michelle Carlson and Patricia Maloney, the directors whose hard work stewarded this publication through most of its history. My presence here has really been a blip. Um, but I also want to thank this past year, the Kenneth Raynan Foundation for its support and to all of the individuals and organizations who donated to make our work possible over the course of the last 10 years. Um, and there's many others who have put in work to both build and support this organization. I'm sorry I'm not able to thank everybody individually. Um, lastly, I want to thank all of you participants, panel participants and attendees for your interest and support and for joining us in this conversation tonight. Um, let's get rolling on that. Well, thank you so much, Christina. Um, so just to reiterate, our conversation will be about the field of art publishing. If you do have specific questions, um, reach out to Christina at um, Christina at artpractical.com. Um, and before I start with the introductions, I did want to let you know that you can type um, your questions through the Q&A um, button or through the chat. Um, I know that some people have been raising their hands. Unfortunately, we can't um, zoom you in just yet, but there's someone that will be compiling all the questions um, and we'll get to them towards the end. Um, and also we are moderating the chat, so any Zoom trolls will be kicked out. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Um, okay, so first I wanted to, um, all the panelists today to introduce themselves in the very many hats that they wear because a lot of us are artists and writers and curators and, um, you know, just wanted to hear briefly about, um, you know, who you are and what pu publications you've been a part of. Um, in what kind of capacities and how art publishing has um, fit into your practices. Um, and so to start, I'm Vivian Sming and um, I've been the editor in chief at Art Practical for about two to three years. Um, and I'm here at, in my home in Santa Clara County where I've been sheltering in place for 60 days. Ah! <laughs> uh, yeah, 60, that's pretty incredible. Um, and I am an artist who sort of fell into writing and publishing. I'm really invested in fostering arts discourse in the many forms that it can take. Um, and arts criticism specifically is a way for, um, for me to get outside of my own very narrow focus and experience as an artist. I think as artists, we can, you know, kind of, we want our work to do a specific thing. And when we don't see other work that does that specific thing, we can kind of easily dismiss it. Um, and so arts criticism ha and thinking and writing about other people's work has been really a way to um, appreciate art and, and garner that some enthusiasm and cultivate um, that in others as well. Um, and outside of Art Practical, I run Swing Swing Books where I publish artist books and editions and some you know, hybrid genre works for a lack of a better term um, as a way to think through the ways that art practices can exist in the book form. Um, so that's me, um, Galare. I will pass the mic to you. Hi, thanks for the virtual mic. Um, Thanks for having me today. It's really nice to be in conversation with all of you and thanks for attending um, this conversation along with us from your homes. Uh, I'm Gilare and I'm uh, an artist and writer. Um, I also had 
I was lucky to work with Art Practical for a year in 2017 through 2018 as a regional editor in Los Angeles and Southern California. Um, yeah, I co-founded Contemporary uh, in 2016, and then I've been writing for various publications, including the uh, Temporary Art Review, um, Brooklyn Rail, Extra, uh, et cetera. And I'm uh, tuning in from my home in Los Angeles. James? Hi, uh, James McAnally. I'm here in my home in St. Louis, Missouri, the interloper, I think, outside of the West Coast uh, to Art Practical's geographic region. But I'm um, coming to this conversation um, out of um, an eight-year run as a publisher with Sarita Hun of Temporary Art Review, um, which closed last year and transitioned into a new project we just announced called March. Uh, you can find out about that march.international. Um, and my practice is as a critic and curator, so I also run a space here in St. Louis called The Luminary, which does exhibitions and residencies and uh, lots of public programs. Um, and kind of broadly, I'm, I'm really interested in approaching the conversation. I talk about my work um, through the lens of strategic criticism and uh, focus a lot on kind of the infrastructures that go in to support the art world. And that's uh, where I practice most of my writing as well, um, including a piece that I guess just went up on Art Practical today. So. Vivian, should I go? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mickey Meng, and I just want to thank Art Practical, uh, Christina Linden, and Vivian for having me here today on the panel. Um, thanks also to the important work that you do over there. Um, so my name is Mickey Meng, and I've been working in the Bay Area um, for about 10 years as a uh, curator, dealer, uh, organizer, um, and recently publisher. Um, so uh, in 2018, I founded Art Ann, which is a publishing uh, and uh, partnership initiative that's based in the Bay Area. Uh, previously, I um, was a director at Altman Siegel, and prior to that, I was at the Wattis Institute for about six years. I organized the residency program for artists um, and also was an assistant director and curator. Uh, while I was there, I worked on a few different exhibitions and um, biennial projects, uh, such as the 12th Istanbul Biennial, the 9th Shanghai Biennial, um, uh, Curity Show LAX Art, um, and a few other just miscellaneous projects. And then I was at Regan Projects and spent, um, was in LA for six years prior to that. So um, that's my introduction, <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Vivian, and thank you for ever, thank you to everyone for the invitation to participate in this panel and to the other panelists and to everyone who is um, zooming in for us, zooming in for this today. Um, I write my I consider my home base as a writer to be KQED Arts. Um, that was my first job out of CCA. Um, I finished the curatorial practice program there in. 2012 and have been uh, cultivating a writing practice and curatorial practice um, since then. Um, I'm also more formally a senior editor at the online publication Humble Arts Foundation, which is dedicated to new and emerging um, primarily photographers, but we do tend to branch out into film and uh, new media work as well. And so that consists of reviews and interviews and online exhibitions. Um, and then uh, I've, I'm a regular contributor to a variety of other publications, including um, Bomb, Hyperallergic, uh, Aperture, Photograph Magazine. Um, I tend to write almost exclusively about photo, but I'm uh, realizing that's something I want to branch out in, branch out in terms of content. And uh, as a curator, I've been fortunate to work uh, solo and collaboratively. Um, I placed shows at SF Camera Work, uh, Blue Sky Gallery in Portland, um, the Colorado Center for Photographic Arts, and collaboratively at Soma Arts. Um, and upcoming, I have a show that's uh, 
we're not sure if it's going to be brick and mortar or if it will be online, but um, it's an exhibition with uh, San Francisco State University. And I have the great fortune to work with Sharon Bliss and Kevin Chen. And we are working with the Feminist uh, Art Coalition to uh, make this sort of wide ranging institutional response to, uh, well, everything that's happened since 2016, <laughs> basically. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, a, a vibrant, creative um, professional life that I'm very fortunate to lead here in the Bay Area. I think I'm um, last. My name is Sarah Hotchkiss. It's an honor to be with all of these amazing people in this panel. And it's very strange not to be able to see all 123 people who are <laughs> watching us, but um, that's where we are now. I'm the senior associate editor for KQED Arts and Culture, uh, which is our local NPR and PBS affiliate here in the Bay Area. I've been writing for KQED since 2011. Um, and I came on staff in 2015. I'm also an artist. Um, I have a practice and a studio, and I also co-run a, a strange little project space on a billboard in the inner sunset with um, Zoe Teleporos. It's called Premier Junior, and that's everything that I do these days. Cool, thanks. Um, and I guess as a, as a further introduction to each of you, I wanted to ask what forms of discourse that you're, you're all working within um, and so what some of the challenges um, that you face with those forms and perhaps if there's forms that you're interested in bringing forward or interested um, in seeing more of. Um, so our practical, we publish thematic issues um, semi-regularly, uh, reviews, podcasts, and videos. And uh, since I've joined our practical, we've really moved it towards an emphasis on um, mostly the thematic issues and less on coverage or reviews. Um, and we do hear, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that, but we do um, recognize and hear that the Bay Area art community really needs a place for uh, reviews and a place to um, kind of document all that is happening here. Um, and these shifts were made partly because of what our readers were interested in reading, what our writers wanted to write, and these like longer form pieces. Um, and we'll kind of go into that a little bit later in terms of like analytics and how we measure success. Um, and we also, you know, recognize that, you know, there are um, inequities and biases within institutions. So as an art publication, if we're only responding to um, exhibitions that are being shown, um, then we're um, inevitably going to be replicating those inequi inequities. Um, so thinking through how do we bring um, visibility to artists that um, may have perhaps never exhibited. Um, and of course that, you know, the challenge for us has been to balance um, that, to, you know, to pro provide enough of a space for um, local and regional dialogue, um, along with some of these longer form um, pieces that are more tied to the theme. Um, so yeah, I was just curious to hear from each each of you again um, on what 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 uh, discourses you're interested in working within and what um, you know what some of those challenges are. Um, Galari, will you start again? Sure. Um, yeah, the kind of work or the kind of writing that I was, uh, I've been engaged with both as a writer and an editor are more um, essay forms, long term forms that engage with art or an artist practice in a specific context. So, you know, more in depth writing that would hopefully be a document to return to at a different point in time. And it would still have some sort of relevance by locating an artist, an exhibition or an event. Uh, in the art world in a particular moment in history or in response to a certain history. Um, and quite honestly, as a practicing artist myself, um, I was interested in the kind of artists that, uh, in the kind of writing, writing that I would have liked to receive as an artist uh, on the kind of uh, analysis or um, dedication. Um, I was and I am also interested in writing about artists whose work may have got some attention or market attention, but um, 
actually I backtrack, I would exclude the market who have got some attention, but not historicized in a way that I believed it deserved or could have benefited from. Uh, so, you know, drawing parallels and examples from art history, from literature, from cinema or other frameworks to be considered in a more compelling and more sophisticated way. Um, I'm also still very interested in the idea of blogs. I've been thinking a lot about blogs, um, you know, art writing blogs, are their own sphere and there's a lot of art writers that blog continuously religiously um, and they have their own sort of devoted readers and their own circles and it's also an old school sense of um, it, it kind of creates an old old school sense of community that was enabled through uh, you know like in the, if you think about the early days of internet however relative that is um, and the sense of community and like a readership that was created through that um, and sort of anybody being able to publish and, you know, you know and the quality of that is something to be debated, but um, yet the act of it is something that I definitely appreciate as uh, something that exists outside of the, outside of the mainstream, but also the market of art writing per se. And I'm not talking about the art market, I'm talking about the market of writing. Um, I don't see any particular challenge with any form. I mean, off beyond the fact that all of them have their own challenges. Uh, there are always those who won't read more than 500 words and those who don't read even those 500 words and those who do. Um, so based on the platform and the type of writing and the roster of the artists and the, uh, and the writers, uh, each of these forms kind of exists in their own big or small bubble, uh, which, you know, mostly lives individually and separately, sometimes with very little, if any, overlap between them. Um, I'm not sure if that divide in the readership of a publication is necessarily a problem uh, unless you start thinking about financially surviving. That's it for me now. Um, James, will you speak to um, both temporary and Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think even with that framing of coming to this as a writer, but also a publisher and editor, I think that um, for me, this conversation is always about the platforms that exist, um, the, the kind of containers that um, offer a different experience. So as a writer, um, like Galari, most of my writing exists in kind of an essayistic form, long form, um, more like rigorous thinking that takes uh, often like a long time to develop. Um, and then there's a sort of other stream of my practice that um, came out of a series of experiments I did um, like uh, as part of my art writers fellowship. It was explicitly around disruption to um, what we expect um, the traditional forms of criticism to be. And those um, those took the form of everything from insertions into places like 4chan and Reddit to uh, direct mail, um, kind of commenting on the disappearance of art criticism as a mass form, um, wrote a series of responses to an exhibition, mailed them to all the residents in a, in a certain zip code um, where the exhibition was cited, things like that, um, that were really meant to um, be a practice of thinking about um, uh, where all art criticism could live potentially. Um, and for me, that all returns to um, the questions of creating, yeah, right, a platform that also is able to stretch that. So with Temporary Art Review for eight years, um, it was very specifically um, publishing that with like the market wouldn't otherwise cover or pay for. Um, that that includes, like, geographically, it was focused outside of art centers. Um, practically, it covered a lot of artist-run and more ephemeral practices. Um, and it sort of followed the lead of how artists were working, um, that criticism could likewise um, be much more adaptive and responsive to those, uh, those ways. So... Um, yeah, I mean, publishing is a form of public making, but also institution making. For me, the, the, the context in which um, art can be debated and really engaged and deepened um, deserves as much care and attention as the ways in which it's created and circulated. And I think that often, um, you know, 
by the time it gets to this kind of critical response, the, the forms in which we feel are appropriate um, tend to be much more conservative than the work itself. And, you know, I, I find that that kind of following that principle of um, just pushing our own expectations and not taking anything for granted, especially in a digital space, um, is a really still exciting uh, kind of platform um, area to start from. Oh, thank you. Thanks. So um, I'll talk just a little bit more about what we do as an art publication. So there's more of a, a sense of how um, how it's organized. Uh, so uh, most of our activities li live on the artreport.org. We also publish a monthly newsletter. Uh, our publication and our focus is primarily on Bay Area, uh, primarily diaspora. Um, it was, it was formed out of both frustration and enthusiasm for, uh, and in response to the issues a lot of artists and institutions are facing uh, in, in the Bay Area now. Um, it, we serve as a kind of a, a conduit to help um, some of our partner institutions solve, solve problems that the institutions can't really solve from the inside. So we kind of batter them with important questions and aren't really afraid to provoke in a way. Um, so uh, our monthly newsletter, it collates uh, exhibitions and events for the month that also a larger list, list uh, lives on our website. That's something that doesn't to my not, or did not exist um, at that time when I started this publication. Um, also, um, as it was also important for us to, when we list events and exhibitions, that um, all institutions, you know, all creatures big and small were included on the equal footing. Um, you know, so institutions that uh, programming from the lab or uh, as a BOMA or the De Young were, were seen as, as equals in a sense. Um, and also, in terms of, uh, we also had a resources for artists category and um, an aggregate for Bay Area news, um, which includes promotions and um, because oftentimes um, secondary roles or you know what they what institutions consider secondary roles, these sort of people moving around, it's quite important to to us local people who are here and uh, who, who are on the ground in the community and it's nice to have that celebratory moment when when somebody wins an award or something. Um, so it's a community builder. As a publication we also produce um, essays and uh, reviews and uh, we also see ourselves as an accomplice or a colluder in terms of working with artists. We want them to see all of the text uh, and approve uh, what goes out so it's in their vision and they are they're okay with how um, their work has been um, explained or identified. Uh, so that's important to us that there's satisfaction from that side, but also uh, we pay writers above wage um, fees to sort of uh, show also as a um, uh, how important they are in our community and how undervalued they are in our community. And um, so that's sort of a, uh, and we also have a pedagogical component as well. You know, we work with students um, in the area when people come to, if we have a curator to come visit, uh, you know, we kind of share that information. And um, also we have this ongoing series called Advice for Young Artists where um, anchor international art figures call in to give advice to students in general. So we had Ralph Rugoff call in, um, who was a curator at the Venice Biennial and previously a director of Wattis and um, the photographer Catherine Opie, for example. And it's just um, this, these one-on-one -on -one phone calls, uh, like, a, um, like a studio visit, kind of you can talk about the artist-dealer relationship, um, curator-dealer relationship, uh, things like that. So that's sort of just a uh, we have events and things. It's sort of just a, we just sort of respond quickly to what the needs are basically, so. Gotcha, thanks. Rula? So I exist as a writer sort of between um, 
short form reviews uh, and say and book reviews and longer commissioned essays. And as I as I think about writing um, in, in the last you know, ten years or so, uh, am I looking as I write like who am I writing for? As all writers are, we're mindful of who our audiences are and working sort of at that nexus between audience and institution. And I think you know, KQED is a good example of this because there's, um, we have a wide, a wide readership. Um, there's a sort of a general base of knowledge. And so it's, for me, it's an, it's a goal to, my goal is to sort of write to, to that um, sort of general understanding and appreciation of the arts, but also to motivate people to go, you know, to check out an exhibition or a film or, you know, read an interview, you know, that they might, that they might not have sort of sought out for other reasons that it may just not have landed on their radar because we are in such a um, constantly churning, well, maybe before all of this, before pandemic, we were in this churning sort of cultural cauldron and there was so much to do and so much to see just all the time. And so how do you, how as a writer, do I sort of put a pin in, you know, a particular exhibition that I'm, that I'm personally interested in and think would be interesting for others to go and spend some time with. And so it's, so there's a little bit of, a little bit of that factors into my thinking as I'm writing about, as I'm, you know, sort of selecting, um, exhibitions to review and to pitch to my editors because um, it, there, it's taking into consideration that there are so many options for audiences to consider. And then within the writing space itself, um, I love and hate both, the, you know, the, the 500 to 750 word format because there is always so much to address and that format, uh, that word length is, is limiting because it has to be and that's a good thing. But it's also there's there it's never enough space to get everything into you know into that particular that prescribed word count. Um, but with that in mind, what I and what I think other people writing in that short form in that short form format have to consider is like how do we get all of this in and how do we balance like the critical analysis? How do we balance the aesthetic components that we want to forward? And so it's a it's a constant sort of shifting in that space. And, and I, I appreciate it. Um, as far as the challenges facing those forms, it's again like how do we how do we stand out or how does the writing stand out? Because there is so much to to read, there is so much to look at, and when the time comes, there will be so many exhibitions to visit. Uh, and so, how do we how do how do we as writers um, sort of make that uh, make that appealing to appealing interesting to readers? So that's that's a that's a challenge I think that I think about. And then as far as um, commissioned essays uh, for books or uh, larger publications, it's how does the writing reflect and sort of take up what these artists are working on and how does it reflect what the work is, all the work that they put into it, um, the nature of the project itself, the book coming together, how does the book or catalog sort of uh, reflect the the exhibition itself. Um, where are the points of where does criticism come into that space as well? Um, I'm not sure that I identify as an art critic per se. Uh, I think I'm more comfortable with art writer and critics. Uh, it has that has more of a, a harder edge to it, I think, than I bring to my writing. And it's taken me a while to settle into that space because I want it to be like I'm an art critic, like capital letters. Um, but when I realized that that's not exactly the space that, say, someone like James occupies more more comfortably, um, I realized that there is actually room for what would fall under the umbrella of art writing that's not necessarily uh, like deep, deep criticism. Um, as much as that is something I spend a lot of time reading myself, uh, it's, I think I try to find a place that's, again, like going back to more of a general audience, people that don't maybe have the same kind of in-depth contemporary art background that uh yeah that there's a you know that there's a space there for that and it's and in the long run it's just a desire to keep people interested in reading about the arts and going to look at art and if there's a way to support that endeavor then that's what i would like to do well sarah 
Hi. Um, so K Community Arts is a little unique in this in that we're nestled inside of a larger news organization. Um, and we're very lucky to have a fairly large team working within K Community Arts. We've got maybe 15 plus people at this point. We're also kind of arts and culture. So the food department, check please. Everything that's written about food on the web is also kind of wrapped up in that. Um, we have, I think this is right, about six staff who are writing on a daily basis who are also editing freelance stories. So that's like a lot of content to use that word. Um, and it really varies depending on what the subject is. We do everything from exhibition reviews, the dreaded 500 to 750 word thing, um, to features, to profiles, um, you know, we do preview type short critics picks pieces. And because we're also part of KQED, we have access to these larger resources, which is the radio. Um, so we've started doing short smart speaker segments, which is really interesting to think about your voice, like projecting into someone's home out of their device, their Alexa or whatever. Um, and then we also get called upon when there's kind of more breaking art news to write daily art stories or go on the radio and do those short segments. Um, so we do a lot of different things. And the challenges I would say with all of that is that KQED in general has almost three different audiences. There's the people who watch the television station, there's the people who listen to the radio, and then there's people who understand that we also have a website that we produce all these different writing for. And so part of the struggle is sometimes introducing those three groups to the different areas of content that we're creating um, and also reaching them where they are. Like the TV audience might be really into opera and we're not writing about opera for the website, but maybe we should write about opera. So those are the kind of conversations we're having on the arts team. Cool, yeah, it's just pretty amazing that just within this very small group, there's just such a wide breadth of how we're approaching arts publishing and, you know, even, you know, who we're writing for. I think that question is really, um, really poignant and um, just the, the many different forms that arts criticism or arts writing can take. And, and clearly we need all of it, right, and all the different forms. Um, so this is a question that we got from one of our um, readers who asked how arts, online arts publications could be more interactive. Um, they felt that reading a piece of writing um, was a passive form of consumption and wanted to know how publications could better engage readers. So they felt like an um, active and contributing participant. And I think this question is really interesting because it just brings up um, what is considered dialogue and discourse to begin with. And I think admittedly, I have this super outdated way of thinking about discourse where a philosopher scientist comes up with an idea, publishes it, and then like someone else responds years later and publishes that and there's discourse that's happening, but it's not really a conversation. Um, so I just wanted to um, pose this question to um, James and Mickey and Sarah in terms of, you know, what are ways that you're thinking about um, activation of writing and um, what extent do publications, you know, have a responsibility to en engage or possibly entertain their audiences? James, do you want to start first? Sure. <clears throat> um, I feel like I'll start at a little bit different point than the question is maybe asked, which is, I think, um, something I've been interested in a while, for a while, but especially I'm working in right now is the idea that kind of texts and publications are um, kind of inherently collective at the beginning. So um, the ways in which texts are formed in dialogue already with um, not just the artist that you're responding to or the institution or context, but I mean, for me, increasingly, most of my writing is done after a long uh, series of conversations with people who may not be explicitly credited in the text, but um, I'm kind of interested in how like that responsiveness or collectivity enters actually before it gets to a reader or a respondent in that way. Um, I do think that there are 
opportunities. This kind of goes back to some of the previous experiments I've done, which I don't look at as a success. It was really meant as for myself, of like stretching those boundaries of what is possible um, in terms of more responsive. Uh, I think a lot about kind of uh, site responsive forms of writing and publishing um, as being a, a kind of where you come across a piece of writing um, changes its its meaning, changes its form. And think that like right now we're seeing that really open up in, you know, not just sort of Zoom situations or Twitch or whatever, but like the way that Google Docs have become such a central point of discourse and knowledge generation or, I mean, as we've entered, um, you know, like we just announced March um, as a publication project, you know, several weeks into the shelter at home uh, towards the end of March. And as we've been talking to contributors and sending out um, kind of beacons of how we're going to respond, every invitation that we have, have sent out assumes that like a text could enter the world as an essay on our website. Um, but it could also be, you know, a, an Insta story. It could be a Twitter thread as essay. It could be um, a video interview. It could be whatever form felt like the content um, called for. And I feel like that just sort of starting out the publication in that spirit for us was really important that just understanding that I think text and readership is a really, um, I mean, at worst, but also in, I think, ways that, that are still powerful to me personally. It's just like it enters the world as it is and you can kind of read it and circulate it and cut it up and use it as you wish as a reader. But I do think that um, kind of writing and art publishing in particular hasn't sort of followed those forms to their full extent of like, you know, in, in this moment of quick, rapid response, like there are plenty of essays, but they're like the platforms that are being embraced are kind of wherever people are, whatever's at hand and where they're spending time. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm much more curious about like what blooms out of that. If we kind of follow those, those ways in which we as individuals, not as writers or not as publishers enter, but like, we're engaging in much more responsive ways too, but sometimes we don't pull that back into our practices. Yeah, it's interesting, um, Nikki, um, just to connect that to your um, project in terms of how the artist is already involved in, you know, at what point are artists involved in conversation with writers and, um, and then also how do you think about the way that it's activated for lack of a better term after the piece is published? Mm, um, I mean, a part of that is more marketing, and I think separate than the actual uh, essay itself, I think, um, in terms of how we approach um, this type of engagement or active engagement. Um, I mean, like you, Vivian, I'm sort of a, a purist in that way, or, you know, I come from this um this history of just of, of reading because I, I was just really I was not passive in the sense that I wanted to read something um and uh, in a way we're kind of our platform is sort of um comes from an idea rather than it's it's more idea focused rather than spectacle focused in the sense that we're not looking to um uh there's there's no um clickbait sensationalism or anything like that it's just an article that um this you know that we feel the the subject itself is interesting and the, the writer can draw it out and perhaps um reading is it's a passive solitude process uh, maybe it's i mean it can be more public and um there's a sense of the public and private in there or this idea of intimacy and removal and this like 
different levels of removal as we move into more like basically I was saying earlier that everything is just happening on this one screen at the moment it's hard to decipher you know what what are you reading are you reading an actual um, academic essay or are you reading a uh, an ad from Salesforce like I don't you know sometimes it's hard to really decipher in this time after all of this um, this corporate marketing so um, in in a sense um, you know, we have other forms uh, of our platform that engages an audience or are active. Um, but in terms of, you know, when we send out a newsletter, um, we try not so much to focus on, um, you know, trying to, you know, sell you like a, what do you, what do you call it, a supersized uh, fries or something. <laughs> It's more, it's more like this is what we offer. And, uh, and we're very dedicated to the community in various ways. Um, we have these events, we have all this other, these other aspects. Um, and this is, this is for our readership. And uh, we hope that they'll, they're interested in, in, in reading what great writers like Monica Weston or um, uh, Glenn Helfand or, um, or others have to say about uh, an exhibition, so. It's very kind of in, not not to celebritize certain writers or or add to that, but it's um, you know there's there's certain writers and and artists that um, people respect and want to read about, and we, so we we try to look at that as well. Um, Sarah, I wanted to ask you the same question, just thinking about um, KQED and all the different media that you know you all engage in. Like, what is a smart um, <laughs> device? Thing you're talking about tell us more oh my God. Um, <laughs> the smart speaker experiment um well i would just say i like kind of starting off on the the question of how to engage our audiences this is like a very hot topic in journalism not just arts writing or any reading of online content these days and there's these whole programs and modules and job descriptions where engagement journalism is a thing and um we have name drop a product um, called Harken, where audience can ask us questions, which has become really important right now in the in the pandemic, like people need facts, like really important life and death facts. Um, before that, it was used for series like Bay Curious, where people have questions about odd Bay, Bay Area things, and they want to know, like, why is this the way it is? What is that alarm that goes off every Tuesday at noon, or used to. Um, and we are privileged in that almost every department at KQED has an engagement team. So even if they're not creating journalism from the questions that come in, they are serving it out to the public on all these different platforms, mostly social media, and then engaging with them and having conversations about the stories. Um, one thing that we're thinking about a lot is when you have a story, you know, you know, we'll probably talk about metrics later, online metrics, but like if you have a big hit, don't just pat yourself on the back for that. That means people are interested in the subject and where is there a place to follow up on that? You can't just like blow it up and then go walk on to the next project. There's probably something more there to unpack or like a larger story to tell or something deeper to go in on or at least talk to the people again a while later and see what's changed for them. Um, the smart speaker world is totally strange and I don't understand it because I don't have one, but we are recording short segments that recommend activities to people that play as part of their news briefing. And I guess it's nice to hear things that are not just doom and gloom news. So people are into that. <laughs> Um, actually, speaking of metrics, we can just transition into the next question about um, ways to measure success. Um, you know, I think, as I mentioned at our practical, we, um, you know, we based what we published off of these analytics, even though um, we recognize that there is this really, you know, after decade of publishing and we recognize like, oh wow, there's an archive here of all these Bay Area um, art spaces that and organizations that have um, are now don't exist. Um, and it is has become this really important um, place for for that. 
Um, so what are, you know, what are the ways that we should be, you know, measuring the success of various pieces or, um, you know, of a publication and how do we convey that to, you know, readers, um, the idea that there, there's things that are of value that, that aren't measurable, um, but also really like what keeps readers back. Um, Sarah, do you want to just um, jump in on that question and continue since you were? <laughs> oh, uh, I would say, I mean, we live and die by page views, but um, there's also time on page, which is how long someone spent reading an article on average, which is often very depressing. Um, but what we're trying to think of more is, um, is getting people to return to KQED as a site, KQED Arts. Um, and that means, you know, regular series, you know, emphasizing the voice of the writer, um, bringing people back by having Rula write for us on a regular basis or, or having somebody have a monthly column that they, they know they can check in and see that writing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'll let other people talk more about measuring success because we're still in like KPI page view mode a lot of the time, but hoping to move beyond that. You know, like anecdotally, if someone comes up to me and they're like, I applied to this thing because I read about it on KQED and then I got it. I, that's all that makes me happy. Like that's a success. That's a great metric right there, that one story. And I can. Um, Sarah, someone asks, what is KPI? Oh, uh, you don't want to know. Key <laughs> performance indicator. <laughs> um, I mean, Rilla, how about you as a writer? Like, what is, what is important for you? Um, you know, KQD is a good example because that's where I think I, I get the most uh, feedback. And it's, like I'll go and you know look to see if there are comments on something that I've written, and it's very rare that someone will comment. And then when they do, it's 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 kind of a big deal because it means that they not only read it, but that they had time to or or took the time to a thought and comment, you know, on the on the on the web page. So that's you know, I I'm glad to know that there are people out there who are a reading and then absorbing the information that I've, you know, committed to the virtual page and want to respond to that. So it's, yeah, I, I don't know about the other writers in the, in, in our, on our panel, but there are moments where I'm working away over something, you know, a short piece and thinking like, who is even going to read this? I had no idea. I don't know. Um, is there even, like, I know that there's a platform and that there are people who are interested in reading arts criticism and arts reviews and arts writing in general. Um, but because everything is so, it feels like everything is so, not scattershot, but just uh, the, the context in which we work as writers is so broad and deep and there are so many options um, as far as, you know, what platforms you're spending time with, like which you go back to. Um, from the writers, from a writer's perspective, I think one of the reasons that, you know, and this is not a plug for KQED necessarily, but I think it's, it operates as that pivoting, that pivot point, as Sarah was talking about, like, how do we offer this wide array of, of content that keeps people coming back? And if they're coming to, if, if someone is thinking like, you know, who would review this show? Oh, it might be Rula. Let's go see if she, you know, wrote about it. Um, that's there's a I I and I think a lot of writers maybe all of them on this panel sort of take that as a certain there's a certain responsibility in that um, to be accurate to be critical but also from in my case like to I don't know put out why to somehow convey in the writing why I'm interested in writing about this so if it's you know a major exhibition at you know one of the Bay Area institutions um, chances are they they might go see that anyway. But if they're not going to walk into Southern Exposure or Soma Arts or, you know, Guerrero Gallery or any of these smaller, mostly, you know, alternative or indie spaces, um, it's, for me, it's important to get those 
projects, those exhibitions, those ideas, performances out into a wider um, consumer discourse because it 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 can't simply be the larger institutional bodies that shape the um, the art world that we live in, both immediately, sort of locally, and in the wider space. And so, um, I don't know if someone reads that and then goes to goes to see it. And if I have the good fortune to talk to someone after they've seen a show at SoX or some you know some arts, that for me is a measure of success. And it doesn't happen all that often, but uh, you know, fingers crossed <laughs> that that it will happen. So. Yeah, that's sort of how I'm looking at that these days. How about you, Mickey? Do you care about analytics? <laughs> I, I mean, this is a it's a tough question for me. Just uh, as I get, um, you know, in terms of just uh, like like the corporate ties to like deliverables or this type of language surrounding it. Um, uh, so um, you know, and we're kind of we operate from like the opposite side in a way like do our writers feel well well paid are they paid properly we care about um you know can we get like maggie nelson to write something um can we do the artist feel satisfied with the the piece that you know and in negotiating that process um uh, so we're quite, we're focused on making our team, uh, our, in, uh, our family of writers and artists in our community feel comfortable and treated in a way that, um, that, that makes them feel privileged. Uh, so it's, that's more of our, our sort of metric in terms of success and, um, and it's sort of, it's a, it's not really um, dictated. I mean, it, I mean, it's just it's we're it's super niche in the sense that um, you know, as somebody who also has to go out and raise the funds and things like that, it's make sure that it's all unrestricted. Um, you know, that's not something that it's not related to 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 other sort of ideas of um, uh, containment or or censorship or uh, so that's sort of the how we what our our kind of measure is. Cool. Um, Galari, can you speak more on this, um, you know, the um, idea of archiving and um, either permanence or impermanence in this field and just thinking through like what, what kind of writing and what kind of information really does need to be preserved? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to speak briefly about that because my personal experience with that has been very, I would say, limited to small independent publications, so I can't speak to larger organizations, but um, I was thinking with this question that, you know, like one with the internet, it's actually really hard to think of anything that is not preserved. So that kind of established a different relationship to um, writing images, anything else. Uh, it's almost like a mandatory permanence that we're in, you know, if not officially preserved or archived, you know, there's like the time machine or like other kind of, uh, not the time machine, uh, the internet archive and like other forms of um, not exactly um, consensual forms that our information online gets preserved for, for better or worse reasons. Um, so it's a bit scary to, to think about things in that sense um, and try to have some sort of agency over that. But I was thinking the most interesting form of uh, archiving to me is actually the kind of organic archiving that happens when writing has circulated um, either through being assigned in classes or referenced or taught or responded to or included in uh, anthologies or, even, um, or other written forms um, that kind of lives a life of its own and exists in parallel to archives uh, as opposed to being, as opposed to, a, to thinking of a centralized attempt at um, you know, institutionally, organizationally, kind of archive that history. Um, yeah, so that's what I was thinking. Um, and I'm kind of interested in that narrative that that kind of organic archiving builds on its own as opposed to a central reference point, which both are important, I'm not denying that. Yeah, that's great. Um, James, can you speak a little bit more about this, um, that in relationship to like regional histories and, and thinking about you know, the things that are happening outside of these art artistic centers? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, <clears throat> it's easier to talk about in 
in retrospect, but temporary art review in this way was always an archive. It was always an intentional um, insertion into histories that we knew were likely not being described or cataloged in any way. So the, the archive function was really part of it from the beginning. And so in, in its sort of sunsetting last year, it was always a conversation internally with Sarita and I, the other editor, um, of how it actually gets archived and it preserved because I think, you know, a, a tendency and maybe a danger within independent publishing in general. And I appreciate that Art Practical is thinking so much about the archive, like as the project of the rest of 2020 in a lot of ways, um, as Christina mentioned in the outset, because um, these are already the kind of most fragile narratives in a lot of ways, like the, the things that independent publications are talking about. Um, they, their websites are going to be down in a few years. Like the projects that it refers back to, the independent spaces, the apartment galleries, um, the kind of ephemeral practices. Like um, I think publishing is one way to relieve the pressure on all the artists and spaces to preserve their archives, like in that sort of infinite data burn and like the resources that that requires to keep everything permanent. You know, I don't, I don't feel like we need to be precious about making everything last and, you know, think a lot about that in terms of, you know, spaces and publish publications themselves. But I, I do think, um, like as an example, I, I look to Pelican Bomb, which was a regional publication in New Orleans that it's probably been a year and a half or so that they closed. Um, but they really like, they knew that they were closing about two years in advance or that it was a possibility. They started setting out a plan for how they were going to like ethically sunset for all of their partners and writers in their community. And then they followed their own program. You know, they, they went through the steps. They worked with um, Rhizome, which has developed some like archiving functions called like web recorder I think um, they they put their archive in like libraries and I, I do think that there is like in in working and publishing and writing specifically there isn't just like it's not our own legacies that we're responsible to it is like you know as an editor it's all the you know several hundred contributors I worked with it's the artists who link to those things and their CVs that you know, if it's an online publication, the only way that they can really prove that it exists is that it's preserved in some form. Um, so I, I do think that it's kind of um, one area in which like that care should be given an attention to like assume the archive needs to be preserved somehow. There are libraries and universities that do this work. Um, and so it's not necessarily a solo endeavor. Yeah, Rula, can you talk more about um, from your perspective as a, a writer and, you know, specifically here in the Bay Area, how, um, you know, you've, um, you know, think through archive or just the, um, um, also the history of the Bay Area. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's what came to mind in listening to, and thinking about this question and then also listening to um, the, you know, just keeping this the discussion in mind so far just that my mind goes back to like immediately after the 2016 election and the collaborative project 100 days action and that I knew that um, you know many of us all of us were just reeling after the 2016 election and how do we start to come to terms with that and as soon as I heard that there was this uh, intervention taking place I knew that I wanted to speak with the organizers and participants. And this ultimately was a two-part interview I did for um, Daily Serving. And I remember at the time thinking, um, one of the rare sort of clear thoughts I had sort of immediately after that was, who it, who will read this? Like, why will this ultimately be important? And, and it's been, you know, almost um, four years since then. But as I look, as I think about writing and um, think about notions of, um, retrospective review. Uh, if someone in a hundred years was to do some, you know, internet, re some internet search for how artists, writers, um, people at work in the cultural sector in the Bay Area 
had a response to this sort of life-changing uh, election outcome, um, what, what would they find? And it was important to me, not that what I would write or what the, the dialogue I would have with these artists would be the most important thing anyone could read about this, but that it adds to a larger dialogue and retrospectively a better understanding of sort of how people were responding at a more granular, at a more personal level to this, you know, horror that unfolded after 2016. Um, and that, and so, and since then, I've also been thinking about it, uh, that in terms of other pieces that I write and um, just what, what picture comes out of this, uh, this moment in time when I'm writing about something, when an exhibition is, you know, gracing the walls at some exhibit, you know, in some space, and is the one of the questions is, is that important in the long run? Um, in the immediate, sure, it comes and goes. But if someone 50 years from now is curious about it, it it will continue to live in that space. And so, archiving, I think, it makes it's it's a vital component of what we do. Um, as writers, and you know, we're lucky, you know, to to work with platforms that have a um, have an interest in that archival impulse and recognizing that it's important to to capture that information because it goes toward the larger body of of human knowledge. And I think contributing to that is one of the things I love most about being a writer. And so it's with that that I approach um, a lot of what I do with just it's not the dominant note in my head as I'm writing, but it's it's certainly in there. And is this going to be useful to someone, you know, five weeks, five months, 50 years from now? And if, if it's useful, if it's informative, then I feel like I've done some part of my job there. So I, yeah. Thanks. Um, so we, um, today we just republished, um, as James mentioned, um, his piece called Dependent Publications. It's on Art Practical dot com right now. Um, and James, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Um, I think the question that you raise is like, who are publications dependent on, which is really why we're here today. Um, and um, talking through, you know, you've proposed a couple of scenarios. One is like self organization, um, you know, this idea that you can um, crowdfund um, um, the, the organization and run it uh, solo, or there's um, regional or national coalitions that you propose. Um, this idea of importing and exporting, like project, kind of project by project basis. And then um, the last was institutionalism, connecting um, um, to an institution. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and also just like how we can overcome the perception of publishing as this for profit endeavor um, that you know relies on things like advertising, subscription, or book purchases, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, this it's interesting kind of thinking through these questions again right now. That piece was it was started, it was originally a lecture um, with the chart in Portland, Maine um, last fall, and kind of looking back at it when we kind of published it basically as is so it's a little bit frozen in time at that moment um but the kind of the questions that were starting then was like i was kind of like looking around at collaborators and friends and just taking an informal survey of like what are the publications that currently exist and i was surprised initially as a lot of them are actually really regionally focused like the majority of the publications that currently exist are regional um, and so that that was one aspect but then there was this sort of wave of closures that was happening in 2018 and 2019 obviously i think that's going to accelerate probably in 2020 for all kinds of reasons um related and not related to covid but um yeah so it was it was taking this sort of field survey of you know what what was what did i could as far as I could tell, what were the reasons that these places were closing? And what I kind of came to as a working assumption is that there isn't a functioning model. Like, you know, we can refer to the for-profit model as if those are working, but, you know, in a moment right now, I, I saw something from Sky Gooden, who is the uh, editor and publisher of Momus in Canada. And like they pay writers well, they have what seems like a functioning kind of ecosystem in Canada, there's more public funding. 
And she said, basically, since the start of this crisis, they've received zero advertising dollars, that, which they depend on to do these things. You know, you can scale that up to, I'm sure, magazines right now are, that are depending on for-profit. They're having the bottom drop out. Um, and so I went through these kinds of different things of, you know, you have places like in the Bay Area, SF MoMA's open space is something that people look to as a model or Walker Reader at the Walker Art Center. So that's this sort of institutional model is, um, but, you know, I've referenced Art Practical and your relationship with CCA, for example, as look what an amazing model of partnership within um, institution kind of nesting within other organizations as a survival model. Um, you know, that ultimately makes the institutions themselves much more interesting and rich. And um, so, yeah, taking that starting point of uh, there aren't working models, um, nonprofits aren't working, um, temporary was anti profit, which we never incorporated formally as an existing organization. And that was itself like the provocation of knowing that none of them were working. So, what if we try a kind of uninstitution? Um, and just to see what happens um, and what other forms of mutual support come out of that and other forms of support. Um, but really, you know, in art publishing in general, there is no working model. And so the piece that I published, it kind of goes through the landscape and then it arrives at what I view as like four provocations. They, they were um, not what I, I think are roadmaps for people to take but there was a sense of for me if like we keep kind of circling the point of art publishing is essential to any kind of art community locally nationally internationally we can take that maybe as a given um and funders can acknowledge that organizations certainly acknowledge it like when you don't have an art publication suddenly like your exhibitions feel far uh more fragile and less like part of a wider conversation. Um, artists feel kind of cut off from um, meaningful conversation around their work. So these things are essential. Why won't anyone pay for them? Um, so the self-organization model wasn't necessarily like putting the onus on the publications. It was putting it on um, small communities saying like, if, um, if an art community feels like publishing is essential and it doesn't currently exist and no one is willing to pay for it, can you kind of pool resources to pay for it? Um, can galleries start to pay for it within their own community, um, nonprofits, museums, um, to kind of create a working fund? Because publications in the scheme of the art world, um, you know, ignoring our current free fall, like, you know, huge sums of money are being paid to put on exhibitions that then don't get reviewed. So like a fraction of that um, money from a museum c can go to support quite a bit of publishing. And so that, that model sort of like take funds from somewhere else. Um, there were kind of provocations to, um, you know, on, on the, of like regional funders, arts commissions, things like that, foundation community to really like strategically insert if, if this is kind of always a problem, then whose responsibility is it? And that, that's really like the heart of it, um, that if it's unworkable, advertisers are, you know, that's never coming back as a model that is going to sustain publications. Nonprofits are more fragile than ever. So what are other models like we, you know, and so, <clears throat> yeah, the piece as a whole really is meant to s sort of generate argument, like not to get people to agree with me, but to get people to disagree and say, maybe we could do this other thing instead. Um, because like operating in this field for almost a decade, like it hasn't worked the whole time. It's not starting to now, no one has figured out the model, the pivot to digital doesn't work. So what else can we do that is um, not just kind of constantly talking about the, the crisis of criticism and starting to emerge out of it into something else? Yeah. Um, Galaria, can you talk about that in relationship to contemporary and how, um, you know, how, because, you know, because the writing is not attached to 
um, as, as a review as, you know, longer form pieces that are, um, that are um, potentially less sellable, <laughs> right? Like how, when you started that, um, were you going in um, expecting it to be a long-term project? What is, um, I guess, what is the, is there an argument that can be made for short-term projects? I think so. And um, I mean, when we went into that project, literally using a grant money that was for writers and like distributing that to other writers, however little that the fee was, it was like the grant money that the Arts Writers Grant gave artists, but then it became a publication and we were committed to paying whoever wrote for us. So it literally was like money from our pocket to go to go to writers, which not everyone can afford. Um, you know, I was able to do that because I had like three other jobs that could pay the rent and I would save a little bit of money to do that. Um, I mean, I, I also want to comment on something quickly before answering this uh, when James was mentioning, um, you know, like if institutions can kind of, uh, how do you say it in English, pay, pay the bill, foot the bill. Um, I think there comes a really complicated relationship with that, which is of conflict of interest, which we've seen uh, publications that are funded, I mean, voluntarily by galleries and, and major institutions and museums and like how that kind of sets the tone. However, you know, it's like, it's hard to like do it like an, I don't know, like any journalistic like investigation effort to see like how the money is shaping what the complic what the writers or the editors are like commissioning in terms of publication. But I think that creates a really kind of uh, complicated relationship, especially in smaller arts communities or, or big, doesn't matter really. Like if David Zorner is like paying like half the operation budgets of a publication, I don't really want to imagine what that publication would look like um, or like museums the same. But um, I do agree that there's really no answer to this. Um, and uh, I think this question is one of the most difficult dilemmas of publishing, especially for younger independent publications. And simply because publication needs money because they need to pay the writers and editors. Um, and that means that either revenues come from ads, like you were mentioning, or grants or fundraising or endowments or affiliation with institutions, like in the case of Art Practical, et cetera. But the thing, um, but the clear, like obvious um, problem with that is that all these avenues where money comes from obviously have some strings attached to them and how those strings manifest in the format and the content of the publishing who writes on whom and on what subject when for how long in what format and what is the pace of the publication and these guidelines are not necessarily bad or inherently limiting but they're there and they form the identity of a publication over time um, and then those factors also also determine to a large degree the outreach and the, and the visibility or readability or desirability of a publication. So, um, and that, that kind of brings a different uh, complication with it, which I think is not limited to writing uh, to publications necessarily, but it's, it applies to all nonprofits or any, anything that, um, any kind of entity that uh, is looking for fundraising or getting, especially getting grants which is exactly the, the problem of metrics um, that, de that determine whether or not an entity, an organization deserves or is meriting the grant. And then, you know, that's when we start counting everything, you know, like as a nonprofit counting everybody that enters, enters the institution and like they're almost like their biometrics, their backgrounds, their age, their demographic information, or like online you start you know, like collecting this data of the clicks and the duration of the time spent on a specific page, and then that get data gets analyzed. Um, and that determines for a publication, for example, that X and Y and Z types of writing are not desirable because they don't have a large readership. Um, and that I think is a major problem. Um, and I know that it's there and it's probably inevitable. But, um, you know, number one, metrics are not 100% reliable. Like I rarely read anything directly on my computer or my phone. I save it to Instapaper or something else that's more like accessible and comfortable to read on. Uh, so, you know, maybe I'm one of those people who spends like 10 seconds on a page by actually like lie in bed later and like read in a different app for an hour. Um, so there's like flaws in these metrics. They're not 100% reliable. And B, they can't, uh, we can't only rely on metrics to think about what kind of writing is desirable or popular or needed because, you know, what, 
what the majority of the public read is not necessarily always what is needed in the field. It, in fact, a lot of times it's the other way around. And then the, the other problem is, again, like this, this idea of metrics, which I think is part of this neoliberal economy that we live in. It's not limited to publications or nonprofits, but it's particularly, in my opinion, I would say problematic and difficult when it comes to that, that, you know, it creates this, this, this a cycle where everything gets measured, that data gets anal analyzed, and out of that analysis comes sort of set of kind of rules of the game, and it creates sort of like a preemptive anxiety um, that really limits uh, the imagination of what an organization can do or what uh, a publication that can do, uh, in my opinion. Um, and that's, that's kind of the economy that we're dealing with, you know, like everything being constantly measured, uh, which definitely has its own positive effects, like when you think about like inclusion and diversity and all of that. But at the same time, it's this constant uh, quantification of things that is very limiting for something that imagines like being outside of it mainstream or like trying to be an alternative. But I'm really at a point that, um, you know, I'm really thinking about the purpose of art writing, you know, not that I ever stopped, but, um, but I'm also why, which is why I'm against publications. I'm not against publications stopping or going on hiatus or downscaling or changing formats. And most, most importantly, slowing down. Um, you know, as, as someone whose job is not directly 100% relying on either art or writing, um, which was definitely a choice that I made at some point, I'm kind of in the camp that I'm for anything but holding on to an idea of a continuous output, continuous production at any cost, just for the sake of a career to last or a brand or a record to be preserved. That's great. Um, Nikki, can you talk about this non-discretionary funds that we all need? Yeah, you know, it's sort of, um, it's, it's interesting for me, I come from a different type of background. I come from an institutional background. And I understand that um, building, creating these relationships with individual donors and saying, hey, I get full creative control is something, it's a relationship that's built over a long period of time. Um, when I started the art report, it was important that we remained independent. Um, and I, I usually uh, encourage other organizations to sort of insist and demand that they deserve to remain independent in some kind you know there's a lot of look to um larger institutions as a savior right now in terms of um uh you know if you're thinking about space to smaller nonprofits using their spaces and um you, you want it in like a maybe having offers for for larger kind of um in uh, like Corp, like commercial spaces to host them or something like that. Um, it's, I, and I've turned down money before because it's, I think it's, um, there's a certain integrity uh, in all of this. And so I've never relied on, on marketing or selling books or subscriptions for fundraising. It has, um, you know, primarily our funding comes from individual gifts and foundations and in-kind support um, and the, I kind of, I separate the two, um, in terms of, you know, how I fundraise and what that money is used towards. Um, so, uh, in terms of like, uh, you know, I understand the difficulties of raising money as well now in terms of, um, um, being either a smaller publication or more trade, um, and uh, I think w uh, a solution for this um, that I'm actively trying to just uh, figure out and it's worked in different models is to form some type of coalition um, because I think scale in terms of publishing is, um, is important to remain at a certain level so you have control, creative control and, and, um, um, and you, know, you don't have to because sometimes when you get to, get to a certain point and you have to um, make a certain amount of money every year and that keep, keeps, you know, that grows every year, then, then you come into these situations where you have to make some tough decisions. Um, and um, so in, in terms of forming some type of coalition in your, your area, it's a way to, to um, stand on each other's shoulders and look bigger than you actually are in some cases, but then also you have your, 
you have your own identity and you can go back to that at any point. Um, so, you know, this sort of uh, fundraising model that is, that is coalition wide or something that reaches out to your audiences in certain ways. Um, uh, but in terms of our, um, our fundraising, it's, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in our, in our base in terms of just a, uh, sorry if you can hear my baby in the background screaming and the dog barking. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, and, and yes, you know, if at times we feel like we cannot, um, pay as much as we want to, or, you know, we, we, then we, then we'll just be real regular and, um, in terms of cadence and that's okay. Um, uh, so, um, in, in a sense also just, you know, our publication, our publication, uh, what exists as online, it's, um, it's not all that we do, but it's all that remains, right? So we have all of these different programs that exist um, uh, for the public, for um, for our art community, for students, for pedagogy, for all these different reasons, uh, for fundraising. But all that remains is our um, platform that reviews exhibitions or talks about the work of an artist or um, that shows what what shows and events are coming up. Um, so that's just sort of the, the way that we've, um, we've, we've, I've organized it. Cool. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're gonna start taking some of these Q and A's from the audience. Um, we did get someone who just asked about um, paying writers and editors. Um, and I did wanna ask, um, you know, when I joined Art Practical, um, um, it, um, we were paying writers. It, when Art Practical first started, it was largely volunteer run. Um, and when I joined, it was, we were paying writers something. <laughs> um, we, uh, we increased that 300, 400% to meet um, wage standard and sometimes to exceed that. Um, and I do wanna give credit to writers themselves who have really demanded this, right? Because it is really their efforts and their refusal to participate without fair pay that has changed the way that um, things really are operated and funded. Um, but, you know, there are moments I've faced as a, an editor where pay isn't enough, um, where, you know, there's a writer who, um, was at work, for instance, for 10 to 12 hours a day and on their commute required them to be on their feet standing up. So they were just totally exhausted by the time they got home and just didn't have that capacity to write. Um, and so just thinking about, um, you know, how paying people equitably here in the Bay Area might actually not be, um, not be enough. Um, and I wanted um, to ask um, um, if, um, we, you feel like we've reached a moment in the field where publications do have this baseline commitment to paying writers or if there's um, feels like this urgency of local, you know, arts discourse or providing a platform that kind of outweighs that commitment. Um, Rula, I know you have thoughts on this. <laughs> do you want to speak to your experience as a writer? Um, yes. Um, so I don't want to alienate anyone necessarily in saying what I'm going to say, but um, I placed uh, two pieces with After Image, which is a long-standing um, critical publication. It's just it's a, a fantastic. It has a lumin you know luminary history as far as um, photo and new media and film. And to place a piece there was absolutely a, a highlight for me last year. Uh, oh. Hmm year and a half ago at this point. Um, and when I placed my first piece there, I understood that it would a, be behind a, a be behind a, a paywall and that it, they had ceased, you know, publishing their um, uh, annual magazine. So I knew it wouldn't be. Enough. For me, it was, uh, <laughs> it was very sort of mercenary. Like I wanted to have a piece in placed in this publication because it's just, you know, one of my favorites historically and, and moving forward into a more contemporaneous time. Um, what I was dismayed by was that when it shifted its relationship or it, it, it established a relationship with UC Berkeley and um, everything is sort of still behind a paywall, 
uh, but they're not paying their writers. They're not paying their writers and they're not giving us access to our work so that we can um, share it in such a way that's uh, just shareable on, you know, across social media. And that was just kind of dismaying because they are, they accept or they operate off of a, a subscription basis. And so from that perspective, they should be able to pay even just a modicum. You know, I'm not exactly expecting a huge sum of money for what I've produced for them, but we are so far past the point of, I think, um, asking writers, editors to do this work and not pay them, even some small amount. It doesn't, you know, understanding that not every single organization has vast sums of money to draw from where payment is concerned. But even if there is a, just a nod to a recognition and acknowledgement of the work that comes in the form of, you know, payment, um, more often than not, that's, that's good enough for most of the writers that I know. It's good enough for me. But to not even make that effort is unreasonable and unacceptable, in my opinion. And so I'm not going to write for them again and had to have this somewhat protracted conversation with the editor that I was working with and explain in what I thought was just ridiculously labored terms, like why I'm not doing this. And just that it sort of fell on deaf ears was odd because I thought, well, why wouldn't I want to get paid for what I do? I live in a capitalist economy. I can only pay my rent if I get paid. Why wouldn't I want to get paid? So it's, I understand writing as a volunteer and I do that to some degree, but I think we're so far past the point of, you know, we can't, we don't get paid for our work. You know, it's all about exposure, like all of these old, tired assertions that it's enough for artists to just put the work out there. It's not enough. It's not enough for artists. It's not enough for writers. It's not enough for anyone operating in the creative, uh, creative sector, because we still have to pay rent at the end of the day, and especially in the Bay Area where everything is so prohibitively expensive here. It's, it's a completely um, unrealistic model to adhere to. So it's... That's my short rant on all of that. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't think that, uh, I think that publications moving forward, there has to be some, at least some recognition of where they stand, what their financial solvency looks like. And that, you know, paying, the, paying their contributors has to factor into that, I think. Um, in thinking about when paying people isn't enough, um, I wonder, Galar, if you had any ideas about what kind of support writers and editors need beyond money. Um, I think, you know, giving writers and artists as generously as possible an amount of time to go over what information about their work or their words is being published and making sure that you get that approval and making sure that the writer or the artist has the last say which I understand that in larger newsrooms is probably not going to work because the guidelines come from a different place. But um, if you have that ability, I think that's something that um, in my experience as a writer and as an artist, like someone who got interviewed, for example, has been, I really appreciated that when I was given that chance to reread what I uttered over phone to, to a writer and make sure that, you know, that's, that's what I meant or, you know, that's what I want to be out there semi-permanently in the world. Um, but in terms of uh, the amount not being enough, uh, you know, I think uh, what Rula was saying resonated with me that at least there has to be an attempt that, you know, the publication acknowledges that the writer is putting their labor into something and there needs to be compensation for that. However, uh, you know, whether or not that fee is acceptable to the writer is a different thing, but just to assume that people are willing to work for free, I think is quite offensive. Um, one a question that just came in is about um, how, how arts writers can engage when art is presented in a digital format only, um, specific to the pandemic. Um, Sarah, how are you all handling that over there? <laughs> um, I think I just wrote my first, I know, I know I just wrote my first exhibition review since the end of February. And I had been really dragging my feet in an anti-internet 
stance, not wanting to engage with a lot of these online exhibitions and kind of what amounts to like a series of high res images that you scroll through on a web page or and there's some really valiant attempts to kind of like recreate gallery spaces and navigate through those but I personally could not sit through a lot of them and it was not a, a sustaining or energizing experience in the way that I'm used to viewing art and having like a bodily emotional reaction to it even if I am bored by it like that is something that I wasn't getting from the online stuff um, but I finally succumbed and uh, Suzanne Leroux, who runs Interface Gallery, Zoom toured me through her current show, which actually makes a lot of sense with the current state of things because the work is about the way goods and people move through the world and the barriers that are that were previously set up and now are even more noticeable. Um, we have been writing a lot in general about things that you can do from home, things to distract yourself, movies to watch, streaming experiences, um, you know, online auctions that you can participate in to support the spaces that you can't visit right now. And I think the stories that we're going to continue to tell moving forward are going to be more about the people, the artists who are responding, you know, artists are always the first to kind of catalyze what's happening and like regurgitate it. It's gross. Um, but like kind of show us a way of moving through something and i i think you know they're the people that we're gonna be following most closely without access to formally presented spaces that we can physically enter for the foreseeable future um i will try to do more online things like i the cca mfa show website is actually pretty stunning i'm not it's like i'm very impressed it's um it was a great experience to go through that. Um, so yeah, I just want to personally give a, like props to everyone <laughs> who's watching right now because, oh my gosh, how I don't even understand how everyone is able to um, attend all these online events. It just, um, I feel like it's showing us how the limitations of the internet um, by forcing us on it. <laughs> Um, another question that just came in is for Mickey in terms of the um, what you mentioned about coalitions. So can you talk more about what the nature or structure of these coalitions are? Um, what kinds of coalitions are you envisioning or implementing? Um, okay, so that's it's sort of a, um, a bigger sort of um, topic i just saw this pop up on our in our notes here um so uh, in terms of being able to have peers um to uh no matter if it's a you know a publication peer or it's an you know institutional peer um i mean i'm i'm just sort of uh, in research phase of looking at um a possible wider recovery effort and what that means um, and um, uh, possibly something that's um, Bay Area wide across art disciplines uh, because I feel like in um, ahead we'll need to band together and um, to be able to uh, to figure out a path forward. So it's always better. Um, we've, I've just been doing um, weekly calls um, with, uh, some like-minded enthusiasts uh, to hatch some ideas. However, um, you know, sometimes it's throwing pasta at the wall, but sometimes um, um, I, it, the idea is to just start creating proposals and just think of envisioning what the road to recovery looks like. Um, it's, uh, it's quite new at the moment, so I don't have that much to say about it, but I know that there's other models who have worked. Um, so one of the ideas that I had um, found it started uh, at the beginning of um uh of art and and um our as a fundraising um idea i formed a group called patrons for experimental progress 
um, and uh, we have sort of um, mem like uh, leaders in locations like LA or Hawaii and or New York and um, and so we could just kind of talk and it's sort of a, a kind of a instead of a too big to fail so it's a it's, it's a it's a too small to fail kind of model um, where if um, you're thinking about in terms of again this idea of um, having your own identity but um, you can sort of uh, create a totem of like-minded individuals to do certain big things that uh, call the attention of um, larger funders um, like a um, like a Facebook or like a um, uh, Bank of America or something like that because these corporations who have a lot of funds they want to um, they want visibility for the type of funding they might give right so if you have these locations in different cities um, I had talked to artist space in New York and LAX art in Los Angeles um, to kind of just share resources in some kind of ways and figure out what might work um, so there's other there's um, um, these uh, coalitions that form in terms of um, nonprofit spaces I'm kind of more familiar with the nonprofit spaces territory um, and they they go in and they fundraise together or something and they because it's easier um, that way because other because it usually or you know the smaller to medium sized um, pool of donors is that size too you know it's just it's usually not a huge fund so how do you um how do you work together so i think there's a lot of hand holding in this process and um in terms of a coalition that's sort of uh what i mean just um uh, if you align with edit with your ethics or you feel like you do something similar to each other um you can work together and um you'll have more impact than uh, if you uh, in reach perhaps and it's uh, just you know just more 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 ha more hands on deck sort of okay we're at our final question which is when I really want to get in so what happens when there is a lack of perspectives and voices um, particularly in small communities um, whether culturally or regionally uh, do you find that it's difficult for writers in this small environment, as we know, there's tiny, um, for uh, to be forthcoming about honest feedback and criticism in order in the effort to support the already fragile and dwindling community. Any takers? <laughs> I could go. Ah. Um. Yeah, I mean, speaking of challenge, I think this is really one of the biggest problems we're saving, where we're facing in the art community, you know, a general kind of lack of, dare I say, uh, sincerity and criticism among peers. And I'm speaking also on my own behalf as an artist and like in the ways that we may or may not be able to receive that and what to do with that. We're the ways that we're not trained in um, giving and receiving in a, in, a, in a thoughtful and caring way. Um, but it's interesting that I think, you know, that, that criticism uh, or that kind of criticism or in that scale, uh, ideally, not existing in the public discourse doesn't mean that it's absent because it exists in the sexy form of gossip, usually. Um, and I think, you know, in our conversations about art, we're generally, this is empirical as an artist and writer, um, we're kind of moving towards a probably more conservative way of communicating. And um, again, it's because we don't know how to love and support by criticizing, um, if that is a possibility. Um, and by criticism, I don't, I don't mean, and the reason why I think about care is because I don't, by criticism, I don't mean like bashing someone or destroying someone, um, but kind of holding on to a status quo that has made some figures sort of untouchable, if I'm, you know, for lack of a better word, um, as if there's been sort of like a permanent seal of approval on whatever that organization or that person or that collective does that it's almost impossible to penetrate that or like question that. And I think that's a disservice to the artists and that's a disservice to the community. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, um, in, in the long run, it's something that has um, damaging effects more than at the same time that, you know, maybe someone is really enjoying that ride or maybe they're also doing like 
amazing things with the amount of influence and their and the attention that they're getting. But I think um, this pressure of having to give constant approval uh, that if you don't give, then you're not being supported. Or uh, if you're, you know, especially in smaller circles, uh, I've experienced that in, you know, among minoritarian artists is really difficult and troubling to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, James, do you want to add to that in terms of just thinking about regionality? Yeah, I mean, as Glory is talking about, this is something that I think it comes up everywhere. And I'm like, anytime you zoom into a, an art community, not literally, um, it gets pretty small. Like we're all very interdependent and it feels risky. Um, often artists are the writers in smaller communities. I know this is true in the Bay Area and many of you have referenced this too. Um, but I think that yeah, kind of building off of what Glary is saying is that I think part of it is kind of pushing past this assumption that criticism and critique is meant to kind of unmake or tear down that, I mean, instituting it as a kind of patient, careful process, um, a close reading is one of the like most generous things that can be done. Um, and I, so I think that like cultivating that, I mean, it's still risky to engage, um, to write. I mean, in St. Louis, it's a very small art community operating in this, you know, I run a space, every, the, those lines kind of in fissures cross all kinds of ways. But I think that embracing that um, as writers, but also, of course, as readers and all the parts of it, um, kind of returning to the generosity of attention, of careful reading, of telling someone that uh, they've, uh, in your view, taken a misstep or um, crossed some sort of line of harm or not looking closely enough. I think that that's always, um, you know, we're all doing this work out of a fundamental sense of there can be a better way to do it. Um, and I think that critique starting from um, care, but also repair, um, but a kind of future making. You're, you're also saying something about you hope that that person re-enters the making process and takes their work further and has more nuance with it. Or if you critique an institution, it's because you want that institution to be better and because you believe in the premise that it's operating in. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's not an answer. It's actually just a posture to, to engage the act of writing and reading. Thanks. Um, okay, so with that, I think we are done for the night. Um, Christina's just going to say a few more words. Um, I just want to thank everybody again for being here tonight. Um, if anybody else wants to come on The View, I can promote you to panelists for a few minutes at the end to see some faces. You can raise your hand, just, just so you know. That's an option. But. Um, I know the webinar format's a little strange because there's so many amazing people here whose faces we don't see, but I just, um, I, I just want to thank everybody for spending this time together um, for answering these questions so thoughtfully, for putting questions forward, um, and for caring about cultivating this community. I just want to echo those two thoughts that came out at the end that this, um, this idea that we need to, to push past the idea that criticism is only about tearing down and remember that it's about love and support and remember that this project overall is so absolutely critical um, to the arts communities um, everywhere. And we um, just want to put in one last, one last plea that we're really wonderful. We got a lot of donations um, just tonight during this um, panel and these will go so far towards our efforts to make sure that this archiving project happens um, successfully and thoughtfully but we are also really hoping to find a path forward um, whether it's independently as 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 Mickey um, as Mickey so eloquently stated there's really a lot to be said for independent operation or whether it's through another kind of partnership um, there's a lot of those conversations already open so um, 
please, we'll put the um, link in one more time in the chat. If you can offer even $5, it'll go a long way um, toward making sure that that archiving happens and to um, making sure that that uh, door stays open into the future. We are really hoping to find a way to continue our operations after this kind of um, light hibernation. We're not actually sleeping, but I couldn't find a better word. So um, thanks everybody for being here tonight. It's wonderful to see you.